Hello and welcome to the Car Care Not channel and welcome to a beginning of a new series, the electrical diagnosis series. Many mechanics, older mechanics you talk to, DIY mechanics, they say we work on cars except electrical stuff. In this series, I will share with you experience that I gained over a long career working with Toyota and Lexus on how to diagnose electrical components and how to deal with the electrical systems of the car. But to do that, we have to introduce a new friend who is going to help me, join me in this series for the first time in the channel. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome our new friend, who is the whiteboard. Fortunately, electrical diagnosis, majority of it is actually theory. So we're going to have to start talking about theory, which we're going to start right after this. Let's start with the super basics. There are three things that we need to know about and understand how they work and what the relation to each other is so we can understand how the electrical stuff work in cars. First, we have voltage. We're gonna abbreviate it as V because that's how you're gonna find it in a lot of areas in the book, in the manual and whatnot. Then we have amperage or current, which is gonna be A in the case of cars. Then you have resistance. Most places will write it as R, or you can also get the omega sign. Now, excuse my handwriting. Remember that I am a foreigner to this country. This is not my native language. My handwriting is horrible. Just thought I'd throw this in here. Let's talk about the relation between the three in a way that does not involve Ohm's law, even though this is what really brings these three together. Think of it this way. Voltage, which is in cars, is going to be 12 volts. That is your constant in cars. When the car is running, this might go up to 14 volts, but this is your constant. You do not have a variation here. Now, some systems will run on 5 volts, some systems will go to 24 or 48, but right now we're still at 101. 12 volts it is. Now, the resistance. Resistance does not have to do with the electrical system, it has to do with the component. How much resistance this component has, and this is something you can actually measure. Now there is something we need to remember about resistance in cars. Most of the time, unfortunately, resistance checks can be confusing. The reason for that is some of these components, the hotter they are, the different resistance they will have, the colder they are, the different resistance they will have. So usually repair manuals will tell you this component resistance is this ohm at this temperature. And this is important because temperature affects the resistance of some components. Now, amperage or current. See, voltage and resistance, resistance is just waiting, kind of the defense, Voltage is the seeker, amperage is the lazy one. That's how I want you to remember it. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to draw a very basic circuit, the Horan circuit. Believe it or not, even with the advancement in technology and all the cars and electronics, the Horan circuit remains very simple. Let's start, let's draw a very simple circuit here. This is your 12 volt source, which in our case is the battery. We have a wire coming out of that to the horn. Let's, let me try to draw a horn. Let's assume that is a horn. Let's pretend that is a horn. Hey, if I knew how to draw, maybe I wouldn't be a mechanic. But I don't, obviously. Then from that, every component needs power and ground because our lazy friend amperage will not flow unless there is a clear path to ground. If there's no path to ground, Amperage is sitting on his lawn chair, drinking his water, not caring about the world. But voltage will go exploring for ground. And we're going to explain what, what that means in a bit. Now, from here, from our very badly drawn horn, we're going to go another wire. We have a switch, which happens to be your horn switch or the steering wheel switch. Very simple. This little arm closes, now we have a continuous path to ground. Whenever you see this symbol, 
this is ground in wiring diagrams. Now, it will be a lot nicer and more neatly written, but you get the idea. So, you close the switch, this little arm comes down, closes the circuit. Now, whoa, lo and behold, voltage comes out. Wait a second, I have ground. Now amperage immediately flows and energizes the horn. As soon as you let go of the switch, voltage comes down, stops right here at this very tip. I have no path to ground. Amperage goes back on the lawn chair. This is so important that you comprehend this very basic principle because here is where we're going to go into the next level. A voltmeter, very innocent looking voltmeter. This voltmeter that is horribly drawn is set on volts DC because our voltage in cars are DC, direct current. When you have your voltmeter set, you're going to have two leads. One of them is the red, one of them is the black. That's pretty much the standard. Well, if I take my black lead to ground, and then with my test lead, which is the red one, I go check voltage here. I have nothing. I have zero volt because there's no path. But most people, and this is what is important that you understand. That's why I told you voltage is a seeker. If you go check voltage right here, you will have standing 12 volts because voltage went through the resistance because we don't have current flow. It actually flew through this resistance and went through and stopped right here. Now, the minute you connect this and we no longer have an open circuit, current will flow. And here's what happens to voltage when current flows. Current will carry the voltage here. Voltage is a seeker. You put it in a battle against resistance, it's going to dissipate. It's gone. That's how I want you to think about it. So if I take my same voltmeter right now and check here, I have 12 volts because the voltage is still seeking. Once it goes inside the component that now has current applied to it because we have ground, voltage is defeated. This is called voltage drop. Also a very important thing that you comprehend and know why sometimes we have electrical issues. Now, if I take my meter and check here, I should have zero volts because all the voltage went through the resistance with current, it dropped to zero because this, this, this load consumed that voltage. I know some of you will come up and say it's not exactly like that, but we are trying to learn how to fix cars, not become college professors. So keep that in mind as well. Having said that, this is the most basic circuit you will ever see in a car. It is a lot more complicated than that usually, but we started with the very basic. Now let's talk about another thing. Let's take out our circuit here, our beautifully drawn circuit. Let's talk about circuits themselves and how that voltage drop is gonna vary. We have two types of circuits. We have series and parallel circuits. These are the two main circuits you're going to find in cars. And let's take an example of each. The parallel circuit, very simple, extremely simple. Basically, your 12 volt source, you have a wire, goes to our bulb and goes to ground. This is a parallel circuit. Basically, the voltage with the amperage, because now we have a path to ground, is going to go here, voltage drops completely, goes to ground. Very basic circuit. Now, if I draw another 12 volts, very nice drawn bulb, and I do this. We have just drawn the circuit of the headlights. This is one headlight, this is the other, you got 12 volts. And let's say you have a little switch here and a little switch here. 
When you turn on your headlights, these switches can connect, and now your headlights come on. Very simple. Well, let's talk about the series circuit, because the way they use series circuits in cars are very interesting. There are not a lot of applications, but there are certain applications that really, it will make you wonder. Here's what they do. The same headlights, let's say these are now the high beams. You turn the switch, they come on, life is good. But what happens if I all of a sudden take these grounds out of play, I connect these two bulbs, I take this out of play, and I make the ground here. Here's what's going to happen in this case. And now we switched to a series circuit. And the reason it's series, your loads or your, your components, the bulbs, are in the same line. So now here's what voltage and amperage has to do. We come here. If we drop all our 12 volts here, there's nothing to power this bulb anymore, and there is no explorer to take us to ground. Because remember, amperage does not flow alone. It takes the voltage with it. Unless it has a direct clear to ground, then it loses the voltage. So what is going to carry that amperage from here to here? Nothing if you don't have voltage. So if I have zero volts here, this circuit stops because we can't. So here's what can happen in this case. 12 volts. Let's say these are equal loads, so they're the same type of bulb. We're going to drop 6 volts here. We still have 6 volts in this wire. And we're going to drop the second 6 volts, and then we have nothing here. This is how a series circuit works. But better yet, this is how your daytime running lights work. In a very complicated fashion, how they make the switch. But in essence, basically they switch the regular high beams into a series circuit, and now you have daytime running lights where the light comes on dim, because now each bulb is only using six volts instead of 12 at full brightness. This is the difference between those two. And it is important that when we go diagnosing and we check here, wait a second, why do I have six volts? You look at your diagram, yeah, I have six volts because this is a series circuit where the loads are distributed that's why I have six volts in between the two, two components or the two bulbs. I hope you are following this because this is the extreme basics. And there are people who really despise electrical diagnosis and looking at electrical diagrams. But if these basics seem complicated or seem like they're too much or I'm not understanding this, this is where you want to draw the line and keep focused on the basics, because if this does not make sense, nothing else, when we get more advanced in the series and with cars, will make sense at all. And guess what? If you don't understand how something works, you'll never be able to fix it. You'll just be throwing darts at it until you get lucky and something catches. This is very important that we comprehend the basics. Now, in this circuit, in this series circuit, if I go check my voltage here, I have six volts. What happens if I check my voltage right here? I have zero, because now we have dropped our voltage. We went to ground. As soon as you have a direct path to ground, we lost our voltage. That's it. We dropped our entire voltage, headed to ground. That's it. The minute, however, and this is where I told you to focus on that point, what happens if I cut this ground right here? Now we do not have a path to ground. So when I go check with my voltmeter, I go put it right here and the other one to ground. I should have 12 volts because voltage will only drop when we have amperage flowing. This is extremely important that you distinguish that voltage will only drop when there is amperage, when there is a direct path to ground. It's not, a, it's not like we're going to do one of these, because that would be very bad. This is something about the relationship, and this is perhaps the only time 
we will get close to Ohm's law because remember, we're trying to fix cars here. We're not trying to design a space shuttle. Ohm's law, very simple. This is the only thing we need from it. Amperage and resistance relation. The less resistance you have, the more amperage you have. The more resistance you have, the less amperage you have. The best way to remember this is why do shorts blow fuses? Let's talk about shorts for a second so this would start to make sense. Let's get rid of our series circuit here. Let's draw a more simple circuit. This is our 12 volt source. This is our wire. This is our bulb. This is our switch. And this goes to ground. Basically, you turn on this switch, this bulb comes on. Very simple circuit. Now, what happens if I do this? I have something that connected these two wires. Here's what's going to happen. Voltage, of course, this happens in a microsecond. Voltage will come out, go here. Whoa, I found path to, to ground. Amperage is immediately going to flow. It's going to flow, flow, flow. Wait, there's no resistance. We all going here because this is where the lawn chair just moved. So you have a very high spike of amperage that blows the fuse. Amperage is what burns things and smokes things and blows fuses, not really voltage. This is another thing that you need to know about. And then there is another theory that I want you to, to hear about. Let's say everything looks great until car got in an accident, this little innocent headlight. We have body shop that did this to the wire. This wire is compromised. They cut the insulation by mistake. They were, you know, hammering on the body, trying to get everything straight. They broke the insulation. Water got on it. We have corrosion. Corrosion equals high resistance. So here's the interesting thing that's going to happen. You remember when we looked at the series circuit where we had two bulbs? Each bulb equals a resistance. S equally, res corrosion is also a resistance. So here's what's going to happen here. All of a sudden, this bulb is dim. And people usually will start by replacing the bulb, check the fuse, they'll, and then that's when they're like, I don't know what's going on here. Well, let's take it to a mechanic. I don't like these cars and the electronics and the whole nine yards start. But it's actually extremely simple to diagnose this specific scenario. Well, I'm going to start checking my voltages. Do I have source voltage? I put my voltmeter here. We have 12 volts. Beautiful. Then I go look here. Let's say this switch is connected and this bulb is lightly dim. I check my voltage here. I have zero. This tells me two things. My ground is good and my 12 volt source is good. But why is my light dim? Well, let's go check a few things. I will check the voltage right before the bulb. When you check voltages on a live circuit, it needs to be live with all the components connected. Because if I disconnect this bulb, regardless if I have resistance here or not, I will have 12 volts because we no longer have amperage. Do you see how that's very important that you know that? When you check circuits, it always needs to be completely connected with all the components connected. Otherwise, all your readings will make no sense because all you're going to have is 12 volts standing there with no current, no path to ground. That is very important. Now, if I go check my voltage here, I will have 6 volts, potentially, or 9 volts. Depends on what this resistance is. Because this might not be equal to the bulb, so our voltage trap will not be exactly the same. Let's say, for 
sake of simplicity, this just happens to be the same type of resistance as the bulb, and I check my voltage here, I have 6 volts. Wait a second. I have 6 volts here, that's why my load is weak. That's why your bulb is dim. So how do you go about the kind of like, you need to have the diagnostician mind. I have 12 volts here. I have 6 volts here. There is only one problem. The connection point between these two points. It's good here, it's bad here. Problem ought to be here. So there is no point in continuing your diagnosis because you already have isolated the fault. I see people in this situation, they go and replace the bulb. Even though they read six volts here, well, let's just replace the bulb, maybe that'll fix it. Well, let's go and tighten this ground, and maybe that'll fix it. Let's go charge the battery, and maybe that'll fix it. But you have a clue. Six volts here equal, we have a problem. We have a serious circuit. We have a load here that is causing a voltage drop. This principle that I just shared with you right now is basically how you're going to diagnose electrical problems. Analysis and conclusions. You need to do your, your diagnosis step by step, understanding the basics. I don't care how many computers are involved. These laws apply 100% of the time. And when you have an understanding of the parallel versus series circuit, you will know how this works. Because then when you see six volts here, I don't care what kind of computer we have here controlling this bulb. I have six volts here. We have a problem. I have 12 volts here, six volts here. Houston, we have a problem. The end. You have isolated your problem. Now, let's say you looked at this. And you do have 12 volts here. Then what? Well, there is another interesting thing. You're going to immediately move to check the voltage on the other pin of the bulb. Because if, you, if this circuit was a healthy circuit, I would have 12 volts here with current, because I have a path to ground. It's going to go through the bulb. Current will kick the voltage down drop it down, and you should have zero volts on your ground, right? Well, if we have six volts here, that means you have another point of voltage drop down the line. So at that point, everything from the bulb back and up should be good. That means we have something dropping more voltage on the path to ground which could be something as simple and a more realistic. Let's not attack body shops all the time. This switch, remember we had this switch right here? This switch has just worn down at the tip. So now when I connect it, it's barely making a connection here, which means high resistance, which means this also turned into a series circuit, but our fault is after the valve not before it, because I have 12 volts here, and I have not zero volts here. That means my problem is towards the ground, not on this side of the circuit. Do you see how that works? When this theory embeds in your mind, and you understand it 100%, like, yeah, this makes total sense. Welcome to becoming an electric diagnostician on cars, because everything stems from this very basic principle, folks. It is so important that th you understand this, and I have talked about this in a very long, for a very long time in this video, but because this is the most important thing. Understanding this will make everything else make sense, which will take us to the next part of this series, where we're going to try to do a little bit more kind of reading on an actual diagram, because you could have all the tools in the world, and you can understand this entire theory, but if you can't read wiring diagrams, it all goes out the window. And then there's your strategizing. How, to, how are you going to attack this diagnosis and have a strategy set and ready to go when you look at your diagram, before you even touch the car? That's how this works, folks. 
Folks, I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. I hope this was not too much. I'm trying to start with very basics here. We'll go in the next part of this series. We'll talk more about wiring diagrams and everything. And I hope this makes sense. If it doesn't, watch the video again. If not, watch other videos, read about it, because this is very important. Folks, if you like this video, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some other videos. And until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.